This is the story of Gene Roddenberry's three-year mission to save the Star Trek Enterprise, during which he went where no television producer had gone before. Gene did this first before the show even got on the air. He made a pilot which didn't work, but which he promoted at endless science fiction conventions and hooked up with the community of science fiction fans, which at that time perhaps numbered 5,000 people worldwide. Also, he made a second pilot, the one with Shatner as Kirk, and he took that around to all these fan conventions and built up support among the fan community for Star Trek. And this time it got on the air. However, after the first season, Star Trek had never ever gotten above 20 in the ratings. And the network decided to cancel it. And Gene Roddenberry decided he wouldn't let them do it. At that time, there were maybe 5,000 science fiction fans in the whole world. Most of them concentrated in the United States. They attended science fiction conventions. They published amateur magazines called fanzines. They wrote letters to these magazines. And Gene Roddenberry had been around this and had used this and had made contacts with this when he got the show on the air. And he decided that he would organize a letter writing campaign to force NBC and Paramount to go ahead with the second season. So the first thing he did was contact a few well-known science fiction writers at the time. Myself, Harlan Ellison, I believe David Gerald, and one or two or three others, and established a so-called Writers Committee to Save Star Trek, which basically was a letterhead with these names on it that he sent around to fans and the fanzines urging them to drop letters on Paramount and NBC demanding that the ship prominent named John and B. Joe Trimble to actually organize a letter writing campaign to get this job done. And at that time if a network or uh, a studio got a few thousand letters over a few months supporting a show, they were fairly impressed. But the Trimbles and the so-called committee organized maybe a thousand fans all told to dump maybe ten or fifteen thousand letters on Paramount and NBC demanding that the show go on. And also, it became a media cause salabra. So, the network didn't know what hit it, and the show went on for a second season. But enormous publicity and huge amounts of letters dumped on the network that got Star Trek its second season, in the end did nothing for ratings. The show still never got above 20, and the network once again decided to cancel it. And once again, a letter writing campaign was organized to dump tens of thousands of letters on NBC and Paramount, and pickets were set up around the studio at some point, around network offices at another point, uh, to make it impossible for the show to be canceled. I mean, the second time around, uh, the pinheads who run these outfits are not so dim that they couldn't see that this was being done twice. They finally understood that these letters were coming from a small fan base, as it came to be called later. But they couldn't do anything about it because there was television coverage and newspaper coverage and PR demanding that they not kill Star Trek. So even though the ratings were lousy, they found themselves in a situation 
where they just couldn't kill the show. So, after the network realized what Roddenberry had run on them twice, they didn't want it to happen again. So what they had to do is make Star Trek fail in the third season even worse and even and horribly so. So they did two things to kill the show. First, they put it on a slot at 10 o'clock on Friday night when its audience demographics, people in their 20s and their teens dominantly, were out on dates or doing something else. A, a death slot for a show like Star Trek. Then they hired a new producer named Freddie Freiberg who was known to be an executioner. That is, he had a level of incompetence sufficient to fairly much ensure that the show was really going to stink. And it did. Uh, they couldn't cancel it in mid-season, but at the end of three, and they didn't want to at that point, because in order to sell a syndicate package, you needed 72 episodes, three seasons. So though the ratings were tanking, they let it go all the way through the third season so they could get those 72 episodes and what they thought they were going to do is try and recoup some of their money by selling the syndication rights to a failed series nobody understood at the time, certainly not Paramount, certainly not NBC and perhaps not even Gene himself was that this show which had failed by network demographic terms for three years had been seen by over 20 million people a week, 26 weeks a year, for three years. That's a lot of viewers. Up until then, science fiction was a little ghettoized literature with some monster movies and a secret language that only the fans and the people used to reading this stuff uh, habitually understood. Star Trek introduced the tropes, the imagery, everything about science, the language, everything about science fiction to a mass audience, big mass audience, for the first time in history. And so the show, which died in its first run, became a huge, huge, huge success in reruns for 10, 15, 20 and when NASA rolled out the first prototype of its space shuttle there was another letter writing campaign and another media campaign to name this the Enterprise and so it came to pass that when the first model, the first mock-up model of the Space Shuttle Enterprise was rolled out at Edwards Air Force Base, I believe it was Edwards, it was rolled out to the Star Trek theme music and President Gerald Ford was there to shake hands with the guests of honor, the crew and the captain, James T. Kirk of what everybody thought of as the real enterprise, the one launched by Gene Roddenberry way back then.